ceiling. Hands to the ceiling. The Low Light Rifle Techniques course introduces and instructs in fundamental self-defense rifle techniques in low and no light environments. This course is a simunitions based class allowing students near instant validation of instructed techniques and is a huge confidence builder for personal skills. Alright, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron Cowan. I am the lead instructor for Sage Dynamics and this is a Low Light Rifle Techniques class. And I kind of already talked about this with some of you, but the whole purpose of this class is a modular skills class. It's not a self-defense shooting class necessarily. It's not a home defense class necessarily. It's both. Um, these, it'll provide you some skills, some techniques that you can take with you that work indoors, outdoors, and give you a, give you a better appreciation of running a, a long gun with a light on it. Uh, what are some of the limitations of running a rifle with a light on it? The barrel points where the light goes. Yeah, barrel points where the light goes. So that is a serious concern. Um, that's, that's primarily going to be your main concern with it when it comes to a long gun is you're married to that light. So if you want to look somewhere, the gun's got to go there, which is a safety issue to a degree. Um, another issue is I can't, and again, it comes back to lights on the gun, I can't cover down on something and illuminate something else. And that's also a concern. And then really the next concern is going to be the fact that it's a rifle in and of itself and it requires two hands to operate at all times uh, can you one hand an ar momentarily yeah but are you going to want to get into any kind of shooting match one handing an ar or one handing a shotgun you can do it but it, it is a limitation that's where you know handguns do have an advantage in the fact that they're they maneuver a little bit easier um, and you can use one hand you're still you you lose accuracy but you can still operate the weapon relatively successfully with one hand, um, whereas with the rifle, two hands on it at all times. Um, obviously the importance of low light is pretty self-explanatory if you think about it because it gets dark every day. Um, and bad things do actually happen at night. Um, I, I recently heard about that, I got an email on it. Some college did this 10 year study and found out that crime does occur uh, after the sun goes down. Um, for most people, when it comes to the rifle, be it a shotgun or, or an AR or an AK or what have you, the, the concern is usually home defense, right? We, we want to think about that. Who here uses a handgun for home defense? Like that's your main go-to. Okay. Shotgun. Rifle. See, I'm a rifle guy myself. Um, there's, there's a lot of myth out there, and the biggest one that, that keeps, keeps rearing its ugly head is that handguns don't, over, or handguns don't over penetrate like rifles do. And the myth is that rifles would just burn through 35 walls, uh, kill your neighbor, go through a stake, and then hit a cow a mile away. And that just doesn't happen. Not with the 5.56. Five, if you're in that medium range weight area, if you're running like a 62 to 62 grain, right in that neighborhood, 62, 64 grain, because Gold Dot puts out a great 64 grain round, I highly recommend it. Um, it's not going to over penetrate to the same degree that 115 or 124 to, uh, grain 9 millimeter round. Um, it's been proven time and time again. If any of you have tracked the trend, you see a lot of law enforcement agencies have gotten away from submachine guns. That isn't because they want to be cool necessarily, because they want to be cool, but they don't want to spend money to be cool. So the reason they've started to get away from submachine guns is because the, you know, if you take an MP5 into a drug house and stitch up a wall, you might hit four or five neighbors that live in the same trailer park. So what they've started to do is go to the M4 based on research that was done by the FBI, the DEA, the military. They basically built houses and shot them up and said, okay, well, this over penetrates less than this. Um, one of the most popular home defense weapons is a 12-gauge shotgun. Um, depending on what you load it with, you're going to have over penetration problems as well. Um, double lot buck is notorious for burning through a house. Uh, slugs, obviously a lot worse. Um, if you're running number six or number four shot, you're usually pretty good to go. All right, so let's talk about equipment selection. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and grab one of my guns right here. Um, this is pretty much a standard home defense setup for me. I have a weapon light. I have an optic. I have backup iron sights, which won't even come into play unless the optic goes down. Um, how long would you say a home defense situation is going to last? Ten seconds or less. Depend and again, depends on the size of the house. Uh, and then it also depends on how the actual altercation goes down. Kind of my point is, you know, it can take a few seconds or it can, it can draw itself out. How many people have kids? Okay, this is going to change how you approach a home defense situation. 
Me, I don't have kids. It's me and the lady. I'm in the bedroom. I'm going to let him come to me. I don't have to go get him. Now, human urge, vapor lock on that noise. Let's go find out what that is. Um, but I'm in real estate that I own. I know where he's not. So I'm just going to let him come to me. But if you have kids, you got to go get your kids. So that changes things a little bit. So as far as equipment selection goes, what do you need on a home defense gun? What do you need on a home defense gun? You need a light. You need a sling. And you need some kind of sighting system. And that's pretty much it. Then again, going beyond that, what else can you put on the gun? I mean, you could run a suppressor, obviously, because that's going to be better for your ears. Um, because I don't know if you know, but without hearing protection, these things are pretty loud. Uh, especially in, in close quarters. Um, they can get, they can get kind of loud. You don't need a whole lot of accessories. You want to keep the, the rifle pretty lightweight. Um, obviously, you should, your stock should be set up exactly where you want it. You don't want to be screwing that with that in the middle of the night. And then, you know, where do you store it? If you've got kids, it's probably in a gun safe, right? Or you, you know, you've, if your kids are old enough and you trust them, you don't have to worry about the gun safe. Um, you can store it somewhere close by. Mine's right by the bed because I don't have kids. Um, and the dog hasn't figured out how to be dangerous around this. He hasn't even knocked it over. He doesn't really go near it. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, your muzzle brake or your compensator obviously is going to be a concern when you think about shooting indoors. Whenever you're looking for a brake or a compensator or a flash hider or whatever you're going to put on the gun, I highly recommend that you find the opportunity to shoot that thing in close quarters. You know, obviously we're hearing protection, but get an idea how, how concussive the force is around walls. I use Battle Comp. I know they're not the best um, compensator to use indoors, but there are worse ones out there. And the battle comp does well for me over the entire board of performance, not just indoors. So it's one of those things where I know there might be a product that works a little better indoors, but I'm so happy with the, this battle comp overall that I'm going to stick with it. All right, so let's just real quick, we'll, we'll finish our equipment talk right now. We'll talk about our, our grip options. Vertical grip. Um, as I was just saying, when this rail came out, they, the military had to put a bunch of stuff on the rail, so they, they basically said, okay, well, we're going to give you a vertical foregrip so you have a place to put your hand. Awesome. Like I said, these grips are great for close quarters. The further you are away from your target, the less advantageous this grip is because it puts a lot of force on, on the, basically the muzzle of the weapon. If I'm under stress and I'm cinched into this gun, I'm pulling the gun towards my shoulder. Under recoil, I may dip it because of the force I'm putting on. I'm, there's a lot of directward pressure, but because of the mounting of the grip itself, I'm driving the gun down. Can I press out on it? Yeah, but I don't think too many people do that under stress. Um, so these grips are awesome in the fact that they give you a place to put your hand on a shorter drop-in rail. They're not awesome for distance because they do affect um, accuracy greatly. Now, can you go with a thumb brake style? Run it like that, absolutely. That's how I would recommend doing it. Um, especially if you're going to run a light, you got to have your thumb free anyway to activate that light source. Now, what other kind of grips do we have? Well, I see one right here. We got the AFG. I like the AFG uh, well enough. One thing I don't care for about it is it's kind of one trick pony. It, it only gives me this option. What other options do I have with this grip besides holding the gun like this? I pretty much have to go thumb over bore, right? Now, it also takes up a lot of real estate. So on a shorter rail, if I want to change grips or if I need to change grips, what options do I have? Not a lot, right? I can come back behind and go into kind of an Olympic grip or I can go magway. Those are my options because I can't really get a stable Olympic platform or a stable long range platform with this thing in the way on a rail this short. If you want to run F AFG, I recommend running a longer rail just so you have more space to change your grip, because there is no one true grip. You will change your hand positioning, your support hand positioning on the rifle dependent on the situation. And you guys, we're gonna get into that. Um, and then we have, uh, what I prefer is the hand stop. What's good about the hand stop? It gives me an instant indexing position for my preferred or my most used grip style. Um, I kinda use an overbore, but I don't go thumb over. I literally just run the gun like that. I hold it like that. Uh, so it's very easy for me to drive the gun, and if I need an alternate grip, I have enough rail space, it gives me that option. 
I can go to a C clamp off a barricade, or I can go to a traditional Olympic palm grip, or I can go magwell. I've got a lot of room in here. It gives me a lot of options. So, obviously, the most basic uh, technique we want to talk about is the use of cover and concealment, right? I, I got a hard wall or a door frame or something like that. Anything I can use to obscure my body from my threat. Now, we already talked about how darkness is concealment, right? If we're not illuminating ourselves, nothing's illuminating us, we're not using the light, we're, we're, we're going to be fairly concealed based on availability of light. But if I have a hard object and it, it exposes to the right, obviously most people who shoot from the right shoulder aren't going to have a problem. It's really as simple as getting a little bit off of it, coming around it. it that's just isolating the skill. If I'm using this object for cover, not if I'm moving past it, but if I'm going to stop here, do I want my light to illuminate me? So if I'm shooting off cover, can I get some backsplash? So I want to push the light past the cover as much as possible, right? What are some concerns of doing that, though? The bad guy grabbing our gun. So my personal advice is clear your cover before you use it, if you have time. In a situation like that, I would literally pie it, get out here, illuminate as necessary. Okay, there's no one there. I can set up and use this. Some disadvantages to that right off the bat is I've used the light to illuminate this area, so anybody watching knows I'm in this area. That's one drawback. That's why that technique is something you might want to think about. Is there an advantage to it, or is there enough ambient light that I don't have to do that? We should never use the light for navigation if we don't have to. If there's enough light available to see with my own eyes that there's not a person there, I should not use the light. Now, if I encounter a person, I go to the light. But just for the sake of clearing uh, a, a cover or concealment that I want to use, enough ambient light, don't use it. If their ambient light is present, if it's not present, I kind of pie around it, get an idea, okay, I can set up. I've gone far enough to know there's not a person right here. How much further can I go? Well, at this point, I can come into the shoulder if I want to or still keep the gun at a high ready, lean out, get an idea. From right here, if I see a bad guy, I can immediately gun up and engage. Go to the light, get control, do whatever I have to do. But using the object itself, it's as simple as, okay, here's my cover object. I'm based off of it. I want to be back as far as I can, but I don't want backsplash off that wall from my light. So I need to get the light past the cover before I activate it, which is a little disconcerting for some people because they're going to be out there without eyes for a split second before they turn the light on. I'm actually kind of okay with it because it, if there's ambient light especially, it gives me a good view before I announce my presence. So I come out, illuminate, don't see anything, I'm back in. All right, now do it from the kneeling. From the kneeling. You hear something? Because be aware, every time I come back in, I lose control of that real estate. So whatever happens out there, I'm unaware of because I'm in here and I can't see it. I can only see what I can see. So if there's stuff going down right there, like say the bad guy moves from left to right, I have no idea that just happened. So I might want to get a second peek. So I can take my second peek, come out, illuminate or I can go to a kneeling so if the bad guy's waiting for me when I go out this time he won't know I'm there he'll expect me up there and now I'm down here now say I come out okay it's still clear I need to move that way at this point while maintaining control I can light off come up keep my gun at high ready and start to move that's the easy way now Let's talk about the hard way. What if my cover exposes to the left and I'm shooting right shoulder? Do I switch shoulders? Not always. Not always, but always if you're comfortable with it and you have time. There's nothing pressing me. Say there's nothing pressing me. I need to go this way, but I don't have to move fast. I'm looking, I'm just searching, I'm being quiet, taking my time. Whatever the situation may be, I can run my sling out to be ready for it, which I always should. You all should run your sling out to be ready to make a transition. 
unless you expect to use both hands, and then you should run your sling in so the weapon is going to be tight to the body. But I need to, I need to clear this way. Now, if I'm running the rifle on my right shoulder, I have to lean out a lot further to get out there. It also makes life a little unstable based on your footwork, how wide your stance is going to be when I get to this wall. If I just come up to this wall and I'm like, okay, let me, let me get my clearance peak, okay? I've got some windows here, reflective surfaces. If there's enough available ambient light, obviously if it's this bright in here, I'm not going to be using a light at all. But say it's dark and I've got enough ambient light, I can see reflective surfaces, I can see if this is a dead wall or if there's a cubby hole there. Well, I know there's a cubby hole there because I've been over there before. But if I have no knowledge of this hallway whatsoever, I have no idea, I might think this is the end of the wall. When in actuality, it's not. Rooms aren't always square. And hallways aren't always flat. So I have basically a really good hiding space for somebody right here that I, I would want to concern myself with. But just for the sake of transitions, I can come all the way out. I can come all the way out. Or I can shoulder over and come all the way out. Or I can switch hands, establish proper control, and come all the way out. Are you going to encounter more right side or left side exposures? Exactly. Exactly. Right? So you need to be prepared for this. Now, obviously, in the heat of the moment, if I need to fight my way around this corner, it's so easy for me to just, okay, I'm good and I'm moving. But if I'm moving slow, I'm taking my time, and I need to maximize my protection, there's a couple techniques that I've already kind of demonstrated to do that. If I need to come over shoulders, the easiest way to do it quickly is literally just transfer the rifle over to my left shoulder and go from there. I can still control the gun this way. It's for a limited time only. That's the only time I use this technique. It's not an extended use technique. It's literally just peak and then I move on. But if I'm, if I'm worried about stability, then I simply just transfer the rifle's control to this hand. A couple different ways I can do that, obviously. The handoff doesn't really matter as long as it's fast and efficient. Some people say support hand first, some people say control hand first. I don't really care. If I had to pick one, I'd say control hand first, just so you can get back on the gun faster. So if I come over, okay, now I'm here, control hand first. Okay, now I'm here, support hand first. How do I do support hand first? It, it's half dozen and one, six to the other. It's still got to happen but get your hand control back as soon as possible. Eye dominance is gonna be an issue. That's why we wanna run optics. And that's why we wanna avoid, for home defense at least, those one by four, one by six magnified scopes. They're awesome for daylight shooting when you have time to set up eye relief and things like that. If you've never transitioned the scope from your right to your left eye and tried to establish a sight picture, it's interesting the first couple times. It makes you think like you're kind of schizophrenic. Um, so for any kind of close quarters rifle, I recommend red dots. How about iron sights? Some guys say iron sights, iron sights, iron sights. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now, no. Especially for transitions from shoulder to shoulder. Why? If, well, dominant eye and I'm dealing with multiple visual planes. With a red dot, I have to deal with two visual planes, the dot and the target. With sights, I have to deal with the rear sight the front sight, the target. Is that a problem? Now, if I have to throw an eye dominance issue into that, is that an even bigger problem? Absolutely. So for the purposes of self-defense weapons, I don't mess with iron sights unless I don't have a choice. They're on my gun, they're available to me. But I'm not gonna use them unless my optic goes down. And even then, for close quarters, I'm probably just gonna put my front sight post up and use that. Switch. Exactly. Kneel. Switch. So I've got two problems. I've got a complete lack of light once I get in there, and I'm navigating very tight quarters. I get to this door, the so-called fatal funnel. I'm going to strobe illuminate and kind of pie it and see everything that I can see. Anybody in there knows I'm out here. I've already kind of announced that. So when I make entry, i got to do it fast, right? So I want to come in fast and then I need to get light on the most likely place for my bad guy to be. Now, pretending that I don't know 
the room I'm coming into, I don't know where that's going to be, so I'm going to need to see the whole room as quickly as possible. Um, if I'm relatively sure a threat is in this room, I'm going to be on the gun pointing at it where people usually are, which is straight out. If I'm not really sure about a person, I'm going to illuminate the floor, illuminate the ceiling to kind of cast that light. But let's just for the sake of this, I'm going to come in like I'm expecting a bad guy. So I come in fast, I get my strobe illumination, and I'm right back lights out. Right now, the information I know is that there's a door to the right, or it goes to the right. So I know I'm relatively sure, and I'm just going to start moving around. I'm going to keep the weapon at a low ready. I don't want to bring it all the way up, because somebody could grab it from behind a door, right. and it gets in my field of vision doesn't let me see what's down here. Because right now, look where he's at. Mm -hmm. If my gun's up, I can't see him. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving, and you guys are in my way. I got you. Step back <laughs> you. I got you. And then I get to here. Okay, I got a dead corner. I got another doorway. I'm going to try to move around, see what I can see. Okay, I'm relatively sure there's no one in that immediate area, but now I got to make another entry. The cool thing now is there's nothing backlighting me. So I can make entry, as long as I know where I'm going, I can do it safely without light, and I can do it slowly without sound. I just move into the room, and now I've got to look at the rest of the room, and I know that there's another doorway there, so now i got to go that way. So it's basically clear my corners, illuminate where necessary, And now I'm into the next room. Dude, you gotta get out of here. No, you have to get out of here. You have to get out of here. Drop the gun! Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! Check your threat. Make sure your threat's down. Get that light on him. Back up, man. Back up. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just... Get down. Control him. Make sure he's down. Good verbal. On your face. <laughs> Lay down. Take it easy, man. Drop the knife. Get on the ground. Face down. On your face. Help! Help! Drop the gun. Help! Don't shoot him. Drop it. Shoot! Don't hurt me. Help! Drop the gun. Help! Drop it. He's got a gun to me. Help, man. Drop it. Help! You better back out, man. Drop the gun. No, man. No, no. Back out. You don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Get that gun up. Make sure he's down. Check on them. Put your hands up. You. Check on. Check on. Make sure he's down. All right. What else we got? Hands up. Come on out. Get down. Out of the roll. Out of roll. Down on the ground. You're good. You're good. We're good. Awesome, awesome job. Um, so tell me what happened. Just came in and where was this guy at? Uh, he was back against the wall here. Okay. And uh, I hadn't seen the weapon. As soon as I saw the weapon, I fired. 
I don't blame you. Action being faster than reaction, if you were to issue a verbal, he can shoot you before you can return fire. Right. Now your bullets may pass each other midair, but he's gonna be quicker than <laughs> the gun. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you guys got anything? Good, good job. Yeah, good. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's go again. I was making noise. Yeah. There first, so. Very good.